wretched. Shut! Get your feet up, you horrible little recruits. You're not alone with mother now. I'm your mother. So listen when I call your names. Now let's have some reverse order numbering. From the left, reversing order, number five, four, three, two, one. <laughs> Let's have it again. In reverse order. Number five, four, three, two, one. <laughs> Are you one? Oh, yeah. Are you one too? <laughs> oh, I first met him when we were all in the army from different units um, and, and had joined a, a kind of entertainment unit called Combined Services Entertainment in the 40s. You there. You better mark address to me. Stand to attention when I'm talking. Why? Why? Don't ask why. Do as you're told. You're in the army, son. Oh, not quite. I'm still a civilian. With civilian rights. Now, don't shout, please. What is your name? Please. Bailey. James Bailey. How do you do? Fine. Absolutely bloody fine. But I feel even better once you're in uniform. Thank you, Sergeant. In his younger days, when I first knew him, Kenneth was um, uh, setting out to be an actor. I mean, I think he took it very seriously. And he did have great talent as an actor. He played in Orson Welles' company when they did Moby Dick. And I remember seeing that uh, in the West End. He also did a notable uh, Dauphin and St. Joan. The leading ladies you worked with, people like Maggie Smith. Maggie Siobhan Smith, my first thing, a marvellous comedian. And then I went from her to Siobhan McKenna, who was, of course, quite the opposite. I mean, it was a tragic actress. Although, in the middle of St. Joan, because I was playing the Dauphin, and in the middle of St. Joan in the Chinon scene, the bishop had to say, You stand alone. The Dauphin has told you he will not help you. The bastard of Orléans has told you he will not help you. You stand alone with your own impiety, your own arrogance, your own ungodliness. And he forgot it all. He didn't know where he was. And <laughs> it, it, it... <laughs> he said, Johnny, yes, well, uh, well. Uh, yes, well, you're on your own, you are. <laughs> Oh, what, what's, what's the line? And he went over to the prompt corner. <laughs> well, what is it? Oh, ungodly and impiety. Oh, thank you, yes. And he said to the house. He said to the house. You do bear with us. It's a very, <laughs> very, very difficult play to perform. <laughs> very difficult. And then went back to her and said, you stand alone. And, but this time we'd all gone upstairs laughing. And she was alone. Totally alone. <laughs> and, and so she said to me in the wings, did you see what happened? It was disgraceful. He didn't know it. He didn't know it. I'm going to have it out with him. I'm going up to his dressing room. I'm going to have it out with him. I'm going to have it out with him. And she went up there. And Frank, you know, you Frank Roy, who played the bishop, was all cloth of gold. And these robes were very heavy. And he used to sit in the dressing room with his feet up and pull, pull all the robes up, you know, to get the air. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and it was the boiling hot, you see. And he didn't have any underpants. <laughs> and she came out of his room in a flash. <laughs> I said to her, did you have it out with him? Should he had it out already? <laughs> Kenneth Williams in full flight on my show in 1985. He was a dream for any chat show host. He just opened the closet and he leapt right out. And we'll see more of his masterful anecdotal erudition later on. It was inevitable that a performer with such extraordinary verbal dexterity would be snapped up for radio, starting with a small role in Hancock's Half Hour. From that moment, he was set on a course for a long career in some of the best radio comedy shows ever broadcast. One chap there who'd been arrested for kissing a strange girl in the middle of Piccadilly Circus. A foolish thing to do, and as the magistrate said, in future, you want to use a bit of common. We wrote all sorts of characters for him. Everything we wrote, he did. Uh, he did well, and uh, the ones that became terribly popular were Julian and Sandy, uh, two chorus boys. Hello, I'm Julian, this is my friend Sandy. Oh. Hello. <laughs> Julian and Sandy have a special place in the British public's hearts, I think because uh, it, it's, far, it's something quite unique to, to Great Britain. It doesn't travel to America, it doesn't work in Australia, it's an English predilection for 
camp humour. After we uh, retired from show business, we decided to go up Portugal. Portugal, the Algarve, Albuferia. And uh, we opened a nice little guest house. Guest house. Bona Latte. Bona Latte. It's a regular Omi from Omi. Oh. Yeah. Omi from Omi, wasn't it? Yes, it was. Unfortunately, it fizzled. Fizzled. Yeah. Fizzled right out. Fizzled. Mm. Which was a rotten shame, wasn't it? Oh, it was a shame. You put a lot into that, didn't you? Everything. Go on, tell him you put a lot into it, Jim. He put his pension in. Well, <laughs> half, half my pension, or as the French might say, demi-pension. There he goes again. My uh, favourite character, of course, was the snipe one, what I call the snipe one. Hello, stop messing about, that character. Good evening. <laughs> You're going to ask cold here. You can ask him. <laughs> What's that? I say, you're half cold out here. Can I come in? There's no room. Get off. Oh, don't be like that. <laughs> Move over. I'll sit on your lap. Get your boot off me joystick, do you mind? <laughs> oh, no, stop messing about. He, he had a range of voices. My favourite of everything that we ever wrote for him was a character called J.P.'s Mole Grump Futtock, who described as a walking slum in the first <laughs> We wrote for him. Was to get a, try to get a job at the BBC. He sent me up from the Labour. Hello, hello, Mr. Rawls. <laughs> I'd like to get my aims. I'd like to get my aims. <laughs> All round <laughs> Judith Chalmers. He also had other voices, which he used in review and, of course, radio. Uh, 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 rambling Sid Rumpole, of course. Joe, he was a young court wangler, munging greebles did he go. And he loved a bogler's daughter by the name of Chiswick Flo. <laughs> Vain she was, and like a grusset, though her gander parts were fine. But she sneered at his cord wangle <laughs> as it hung upon the line. 